um, Lindsay update you on what we're doing there. Great, so if you've been at our all hands over the past couple of months, these slides probably look familiar, but we like to reiterate it because we're so focused on Virginia this year. As a reminder, we're focused almost entirely on Virginia state legislative elections because there is an election this November uh, in I think less than 60 days now and every single seat and both the House and the Senate is up for election. So this is a super important race and the reason it is super important is because in 2017 Democrats did make some progress and picked up some seats but in both chambers are still two seats away from uh, holding a majority and so if the Democrats are able to take a majority in one or both of these chambers, there will be a ton of very productive legislation passed, um, including legislation related to district lines that are being drawn for basically the next decade. Um, we have surpassed the expected number of projects that we had intended to do in Virginia, which is great. So right now we're working with or have worked with almost 40 different campaigns um, have completed or have active 66 campaigns, 66 projects rather, um, and we expect to complete almost 90 projects by the end of the year, by the election. Um, part of the reason that we're able to do this is because we're an official partner uh, with the Virginia House. So we're sort of a, prepare, a preferred partner for their candidates. Um, and a huge shout out to all the volunteer teams who have worked on projects, are working on projects, and will continue to work on projects. Um, some really amazing work coming out of, of those teams. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass this back to Jessica to introduce one of our amazing candidates in Virginia this year, Larry Barnett. Well, hi, Larry. Hello, how are you? Uh, we're good, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, absolutely, it's great to be here with all of you. Um, so we won't, we don't want to take up too much of Larry's time because he's literally campaigning right now and there, um, are only a few, uh, less than 50 days left till his election. So we're super lucky to have you join us. Um, Larry's running for Virginia's 27 house district, house district, which is in the Richmond area. But Larry, I'll let you tell people sort of why you're running and also if this is the first time you've ever run. Absolutely. So this is my second run. I was part of that wave in 2017. And actually, Tech for Campaigns was a valuable partner in our uh, first campaign back in 2017. I came within 128 votes of a flip out of 29,000 votes cast. So it was one of the four um, races in Virginia that came within four tenths of 1%. Uh, so very, very close last time. Three of the four of us who got that close are running again this time. Um, and it started off very strong. Uh, so many lessons learned from, from running in 2017. Uh, so you all know my background is in public health. Um, I directed programs at our uh, mental health center here in this community for many years. Uh, and for the last dozen years was director of the emergency services for our mental health center. And I also was the coordinator of training for our police and first responders on safety escalation strategies when responding to people in the community. So my lens is public health, mental health, uh, which turned out to be a very um, resonant professional background to have as a first time candidate uh, in 17 and again this year, uh, because so many people's lives are affected by mental health issues or addiction or having a family member, a loved one with a developmental disability. So all of that's in my wheelhouse and fits under the large umbrella of healthcare, which is the number one issue in our district, uh, concerns with accessible, affordable health care. Right. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear what are the top three issues in your district? Yes, so rattle off, that is clearly number one, and right alongside with access to affordable health care, and of course included in that is this focus on addiction issues and mental health issues. The number two, is really strong support for our public education system. Um, and there's a variety of things there that, that folks in our district really care about. Uh, Virginia is a very uh, wealthy state, but our educators are paid less than uh, $9,000 on average than uh, the national average for educators. So we're looking at fully funding our public schools, really investing in recruiting and retaining excellent teachers um, and building up 
the student support services, the psychologists, social workers, school counselors, uh, we have a major shortage of uh, currently within our school system. So investing in a, a really strong public school system is clearly the other top issue. And then I would say when we get to the third issue, there's a variety of things. Um, living in a safe community comes up for many people, but I would say increasingly there's also concern with uh, environmental issues and increasing awareness of climate change. I can, can see a, a noticeable difference from 2017 to this year, 2019, in the number of people who bring that up on their doorsteps to me and concerns with um, issues related to, um, to climate change. But those are sort of near the top. Um, then of course, safe, um, I mean, uh, fairly drawn district boundaries and criminal justice reform. Some other issues come up in that kind of fourth category with some frequency, but the big two pillars are um, affordable access to healthcare, strong support for our public schools. And um, I know Tech for Campaigns, so everyone knows, is um, running your email marketing and digital ads program. How has that um, work helped you on the campaign trail and what's the reaction been? Um, well, first of all, I would like to just really uh, give a shout out to Tech for Campaigns over both campaigns, this time and last time. Um, incredible partners and on so many levels, not just with our digital ads and putting together a really robust uh, email program, but strategy and development, really carefully looking at how to hone, refine the message and have a really good plan for executing. So I really appreciate the partnership, the teamwork, um, and there's so many things that have developed and come along where we're so much stronger this time as a result of the involvement of Tech for Campaigns. So thank you to all of you for your help on that front. I can tell you what I hear in the community because uh, I'm out uh, canvassing very frequently. I just returned a little while ago, actually, um, and have knocked over 5,000 doors in this cycle. And many people tell me they've seen our ads. They really, um, they're aware of our campaign. They like what they see. I think some of the messages are very resonant with the voters here. So it's clear to me that it's reaching a lot of people in our universe that we're trying to engage and, and get out to the polls on November 5th. Um, that's awesome. Well, we're so um, honored that we can be you know, a part of your campaign and hopefully bring home a victory for you and a lot of other candidates um, this cycle. And we're so, we're so pleased that you could join us tonight. Oh, it's, it's an honor to be on with all of you. And as you were laying out the picture in Virginia, we are so close. And I think the help of your, with your group and the, just the high level of care and attention to what you do, I can see how it's boosted our campaign to the next level. And knowing that you're involved with many other campaigns, I'm confident you're going to see a flip of the House and the Senate here in Virginia. And you will... Uh, you will own a piece of that through your efforts. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And just to give people an example of like um, how, you know, how they can help in addition to obviously volunteering, um, you no, know, what are the kinds of things that you guys are focused on right now in terms of fundraising? Yes, um, currently, so um, we are at the point where we're, our mail program has recently been launched. Of course, you're aware of the digital piece that you're very involved in. Um, we also are out on cable TV uh, with the ads that we're running there as well. So um, on all three fronts, we are actively pushing our message out. And for us, most of our current fundraising is really around maintaining that robust communication from here to um, November 5th and, and just making sure we reach as many people as possible. So it's been really, at this particular stage in the campaign, it's really about keeping that communication very strong, maybe increasing it steadily in October, towards the, the end of October especially, so that we really find all those people that I can't get at the doors and that our, our teams can't get at the doors, we reach them in other ways, uh, through their devices, through their TV, through their mailbox, uh, with your help. Yeah, one of the things I think is important for everyone to understand, because I think people so sort of get um, grounded in presidential campaigns and really expensive Senate campaigns, but like what would an extra $10,000 mean to you? Oh, concretely what that means, that's a, we have a very inexpensive cable market here. So $10,000 is a week on cable um, or a significant boosting of our digital ads over a number of weeks or um, 
basically funding one and a half male pieces. Right. Um, so all of those are things that $10,000 can do. The other thing, if we go up on broadcast TV, that's a much more expensive buy, but can be very effective in blanketing a huge number of voters right before an election. That costs about $50,000 a week. So a $10,000 raise goes a long ways towards getting us up on broadcast as well as cable. Right. But $10,000 could be like two weeks of digital ads for you, right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. So, okay. Awesome. I just wanted to give people that context because I think people don't always understand how much their dollars matter. Yes. Um, Larry, thank you so, so much for everything you're doing and um, we're, we're with you till November 5th. Oh, well, thank you for the wonderful partnership and uh, look forward to continuing to work with you and for all the others who are on um, or are new to tech for campaigns you're getting affiliated with a fabulous organization thanks so much okay Keep good, it night. Up. good night uh, i think that's really helpful to hear from candidates on you know what tech for campaigns is doing for them and and what they would have instead and um, one of the things that we have been doing for campaigns um, is texting, um, particularly when it comes to something that people call GOTV, which is get out the vote. Um, and what we do after every big cycle or even year is we do pretty deep dive postmortems on all the different kinds of projects that we do. Um, recently, we released an analysis around texting across all the campaigns that we texted on. Um, and what was really cool about it is that we were able to tie it to voting behavior. We obviously don't know who people voted for, but we know if they voted, um, which you're not really able to do with ads because you don't know that to the individual level. So I'm going to hand it back to Alex and others to talk through the texting analysis, what they did, um, and what it showed. Great. So Jessica gave a, a great introduction. Um, and just to highlight sort of what this was, we did basically uh, seven months of analysis on all of the texts that were sent um, both by our volunteers, but by campaigns that our team set up and analyzed. Um, so a big meta analysis and then published this uh, big report, I believe in July now, uh, maybe August, uh, to, to give folks a sense of what was working and what was not. Um, so I'll talk a little more about why that was sort of a, a novel thing to do in a minute. Um, but it also got covered by the Wall Street Journal, BuzzFeed News, um, a couple of other sort of political, uh, politically focused um, media outlets. And so really got some great press around it, which was really important not only for us as an organization, um, but for other folks who, you know, we don't necessarily work with who might benefit from these results. So the reason this was so important to look at is because Texting has become a huge channel for outreach. I'm sure all of you have gotten at this point at least one, but probably many more texts from candidates running for office or ballot propositions. Um, this is something that wasn't really around two cycles ago. Um, and so, you know, in 2018 alone, Democratic campaigns and politically adjacent organizations sent more than 350 million unique text messages, which is a huge amount. So it's essential to understand what is working and what needs to be modified if we want this channel to continue to be effective. Um, so we got really lucky in the sense that we had this huge repository of data after our teams ran projects across nine different states and sent more than one million text messages just here at TSC alone. Um, so the states highlighted in blue are the states in which we were running texting programs. Um, and so we were able to actually look at all that data and figure it out, figure out what worked, what didn't, what we could conclude from it. So the first really interesting takeaway was that people who were texted were 1% more, more likely to vote. Um, so 1%, maybe that doesn't sound like a lot, uh, but to sort of translate that into votes, uh, it was the difference between basically winning and losing five out of seven races the Democrats lost in 2018 um, where we worked in Arizona. So 1% may not sound like a lot, but actually has a huge impact on uh, the electoral outcomes. The second interesting finding was that registered voters who were uh, between 27 and 50, so younger, turned out at a rate almost 8% higher when they got a text. Um, so it was still effective for older folks, but it sort of had an outsized impact with older voters. 
this might not be terribly surprising. Um, you know, a lot of us who are on the younger side probably pay a lot more attention to text than phone calls, but it's really important to quantify these things so that campaigns can run effective and targeted programs. The other interesting takeaway that we found was that vote, for voters who were uh, 45 and older, issue-based texts perform better than non-issue-based texts. So what is an issue-based text? Text, um, basically it's a text that includes information about a very specific issue that is important in the district. So, you know, if education is important in the district, you know, Larry was just talking about uh, school funding, that would be something that we'd be, we would consider an issue-based text. Um, so that is really important because you see a lot of campaigns running sort of stock messaging, and I'll talk about that now. Um, but what we are finding is that stock messaging is not that effective. Um, it's much more effective to do hyper-personalized, hyper-localized, and candidate-specific messaging if you do care about electoral outcomes, which of course we all do. Um, and so that is related to this third sort of highlight from the analysis, which is that uh, people who received these issue-specific messages overall, you know, not related to their age group, were 8.2% more likely to vote. So that's it. That's a huge bump. Um, so really important to have these programs uh, designed with the district and the candidate in mind. So I don't want to take credit for all this analysis. We had an amazing, amazing team working on a huge amount of work uh, to produce these results. And we have two volunteers who were on the team to speak about some things that surprised them about their process right now. Um, before I turn it over to them and ask them a couple of questions about their experience on the project, what they learned. I just also want to give a shout out to the whole team. So Jennifer, who will be speaking in a minute, um, was the team lead. So she ran the project end to end. Ron, who will also be speaking, was one of the senior data scientist volunteers on the team. Jocelyn and David were also senior data scientists on the team, crunching all of this data uh, and making it work. So welcome Jennifer and Ron, excited to have you here. And I just want to start by asking Jennifer to talk a little bit about the team's process and, and what you did and how you sorted through all this data. Absolutely. We got together first um, in December, soon after the elections ended. And our first uh, most pr highest priority was to get all of the data pulled together. And that actually proved to be quite tricky um, because we had so many different campaigns that and, and texting projects, um, which while there were best practices, weren't all executed in the same way and some looser, looser guidelines at that point in time. So our, our first point um, was to build that data infrastructure, not only for uh, pulling it, archiving it, but also processing and mapping. The, the texts um, across the three texting platforms that TFC was involved in in um, 2018. And then we proceeded to complete the construction of a data analysis framework. Um, as as uh, Alex mentioned, there were some research outcomes that came out of it. But in order to actually get there, we needed to put together this framework um, and what outcomes there were from this effort um, was a better understanding and a classification into three categories um, based on sentiment analysis that we did of what these of where these texts sat. Um, from that work, we also then moved to pull together some metrics as um, as well as conduct benchmarking that I, we believe will be very helpful for future text projects. And these are broken out based upon wave objective because you may have a very different benchmark for get out the vote um, than say fundraising or volunteer recruitment. Um, all of these lessons learned were then integrated into the TFC wiki um, so that future project teams have one place where they can get all this information. Um, after that, we worked to flesh out the research agenda, considering what data we had available, um, what were the most important questions for TFC, and um, so much of the findings Alex has already shared out. We won't go over it again. Um, but uh, those those were actually quite interesting, um, and we'll I'll I'll reveal my most interesting thing after Ron says a little bit more about um, the process from his point of view. 
Yeah, and I thanks for that overview. I wanted to have Jennifer talk about that a little bit just to illustrate sort of the breadth of work that the team did. And I think it's so important because a lot of other um, organizations, specifically the campaigns themselves, don't have the ability to do that. You know, after the elections are over, they sort of dissolve. And so uh, us being able to persist election cycle over election cycle and take all that data um, is a huge advantage, a huge benefit to actually getting actionable insights that future teams can use. Um, so I wanted to very, just very quickly ask Ron about um, how the team tackled the sort of very messy data science problem, knowing that we didn't have randomized controlled trials, which is sort of the gold standard of data science. Yeah, so we pretty much had to just take the data that we had for the districts that we knew we ran texting campaigns in and then just kind of treat that as a retroactive uh, trial. So it was really important for us to be able to get as many voter files from the state caucuses as possible for that because uh, when you filter just for the places that we ran texting campaigns in, that obviously reduces the size of the data set significantly, which kind of uh, makes it harder to come up with findings um, just because there's less statistical power with the smaller sample size. But we chose to do that because uh, we just felt that that trade-off was worth the um, stronger adherence to the, uh, the experimental design. And uh, it was really critical for uh, the ability of TFC to be able to have those relationships with the state caucuses and get those voter files because I mean, for a while we were working with uh, smaller data sets, mostly just Arizona for the first couple of months. And it was, we were able to do a lot of cleaning of the data and, and get some findings, but until we started adding more and more data sets, like in Texas and North Dakota, it, it was hard to come up with findings. So by the time we got all those data sets in, we were able to, to come up with some, some interesting insights. So that was really important to do it that way. Uh, and we had, many conversations about that. Oh, for sure. Um, so definitely appreciative, appreciative of the thoroughness of the team on that front. Um, okay, lightning round before we move on to our 2020 targets. Uh, Jennifer, what was your most, what was the most surprising finding that you, that you encountered? Thanks for asking. I was really surprised, and this is really, you know, what TFC strength is to show show us the data, right? Show me the data because that that's the that's what has the most meaning at the end of the day. Um, coming into it, I thought there might be some linkage between the um, the length of the text message in, say, an initial text um, from the campaign, and the response rates and or opt out requests. Um, we, you know, we don't have a very good sense as to how these uh, voters' t cell phones treat long text messages, whether it becomes multiple ones or uh, and so forth. Um, and it actually showed that there was no link between the number of characters used in the initial message and whether or not the recipients responded. There was also no evidence of a link to any opt-out requests. Cool, and Ron, in a couple sentences, most interesting and surprising finding for you? Yeah, for me, it was uh, how big of a difference there was in the turnout for the groups between texted and not texted for the 27 to 42 year old range. Um, I, it's pretty intuitive that the, it would be younger age groups that would respond more to texts, but uh, specifically 27 to 42 was very interesting to me because it, it, it was even bigger than the 26 and under age group. So that was just really interesting to me and it showed like the, it, it just makes sense for campaigns to do this and especially versus sending, you know, uh, doing, buying cable, uh, ads or doing mail, that kind of stuff for the 27 to 42 age bracket at least. Yep, cool. Well, thank you both so much for your work on this project um, and especially, of course, thanks to Jocelyn and David as well, um, who aren't here tonight. So I wanna make sure that we look ahead to 2020. Not only will we take all the lessons from this texting analysis and all the other projects that we've done, 
um, but Greg will talk about our targets for 2020, how we landed on them, and what the plan is. Hello, everybody. Um, so although we are very much deeply involved in Virginia, we have to start looking ahead as well, like Alex said. Um, and part of that comes with the sort of a, the long term process of figuring out where we're going to be able to work in 2020, where we want to go, um, starting to talk to those folks and figure it all out. So the way we uh, or so the background of this is that um, up to 2017, um, like you've seen, um, probably in the previous all hands, the GOP had taken control of basically two thirds of state legislatures. Um, 20, from 2017 to 18, we saw a nice rollback, a respectable gain for the Democrats, as you see um, in the bottom chart, but there's certainly um, so much left to do. Not only in Virginia this year, there's elections in Mississippi, uh, Louisiana, New, Jer uh, New Jersey, just this, this year, and the bulk of them um, coming up in 2020. So the problem is uh, in state legislative elections, there are literally thousands of them around the country um, and figuring out which of the ones um, are areas where we can make an impact is a really hard and critical problem. Um, so we've uh, assessed this by releasing a list of 2020 initial priorities. So it doesn't mean that necessarily we will end up deploying volunteers in each, of, each and every state that we've named on the list but we've put a bunch of uh, lists and chambers on there to identify targets of interest and places that uh, ourselves on the, on the staff end are gonna go and learn more about, uh, talk to the states and figure it all out. So if you wanna read the full list, um, go to techforcampaigns.org. It's linked on a banner at the top uh, called the 2020 Initial Priority State Targets. It does include tech, um, states that we know and love like Texas, Florida, uh, New Mexico, uh, Pennsylvania, other new ones like Minnesota, New York, um, and, and Georgia, uh, North Carolina, and, and all sorts of fun different uh, places. Um, so the way we figure this out, because we get this question quite a bit, is, is sort of how do we assess the, the overall roadmap and pick these states? And a huge, huge part of how we do that is a lot of quantitative modeling. So a TFC project called the List Project um, has been, I think for two plus years now, uh, assembling quite a lot of data about state legislative elections um, and information about those districts. So uh, who they voted for, Democrat versus Republican, their demographics, their average household income, all these things that sort of um, all are clues towards uh, how someone's gonna vote in the upcoming election. And that goes along with qualitative factors too. Part of the reality of, of working um, in campaigning is some states have more infrastructure than other states and are better suited uh, to work with uh, on our digital projects and work with our volunteers. So both the quantitative and the qualitative come together for that initial list that, that you saw on the previous slide and is on the, the website. Um, and so we've released that uh, in the past couple weeks. From here on out for the next couple quarters, we're gonna be reaching out to everybody in those states to the democratic infrastructure, um, to groups, to campaigns, to candidates, um, kind of learn more about what the situation of, of their races are, where they can uh, benefit from help, and how can we um, best find an area of opportunity. Once we've had those conversations, we're gonna have our 2020 final priorities list, probably uh, midway through, I would say the first quarter of next year. And as we add a caucus or a state to our final priorities list, that will kick off the process of reaching out to campaigns in those states. And once we reach out to campaigns in those states, we will then get an in-depth um, read on their needs. Uh, we can help them figure out their digital plans and their communications plans. Um, and ultimately, that's the work that turns into projects and work for the organization. So it's really a, a sort of very comprehensive process that starts with a survey of all the thousands of races out there um, a lot of in-depth due diligence, personal conversations and, and research that we do um, in those states and figuring out the very best places for our volunteers to work, which then results in campaigns. Um, so that is, is sort of a, a quick overview of, of what our timeline and process looks like. Um, like I said, it's a huge thank you to the List Project team. Uh, there's a whole host of people who are currently working on it and a whole host of people who have worked on it in the past. Um, it's really painstaking uh, work. Hopefully it's interesting work, but I definitely give credit for all the, for all the uh, effort and labor people have uh, 
put in over time. So just a huge thank you from, from not only me, but the entire uh, team here at, at TFC. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Jessica to talk about one of our uh, major initiatives over the past, for the next couple of months. Okay, and then we'll go to Q and A. Um, so if you have questions, you can start asking them now, but um, I'm hoping that actually by now, anyone on this uh, video call has received an email or a text message about the Virginia Fund, which is um, our big push uh, that we launched just this past Monday um, and only has 30 days left. So uh, the Virginia Fund is to raise 250K by October 18th. Um, everything will go not only to all the work that we're doing in Virginia, but um, the technology that we're building there. Um, you can see the, the link at the bottom to donate, but it's also at the, the top of our techforcampaigns.org site if you hit donate. Um, this is a way to be part of flipping Virginia and building um, the lasting technology that will help in Virginia and then 12 to 20 states after that. Um, basically, there are no additional volunteer opportunities in 2019. We have staffed everything um, through the election because no, no teams will um, get up and running at this point. It's, it's too late. So this is the major way to be involved. Um, in 2020, we'll have more volunteer opportunities and we're excited for that. But just like you get involved in campaigns and you both give and volunteer um, and it shows that you support the mission, we're hoping that people do that for um, Tech for Campaigns and the Virginia Fund. Uh, you know, what's at stake in Virginia is not actually just about Virginia, it's about um, you know, showing what we can do with technology still only three to five cents of every dollar given that typically goes to um, digital media. And so with us, obviously you know that it's going to digital and tech, um, but it's also about sending a message for what's gonna happen in 2020. Virginia is always an off year election, so they're always the first to go. Um, and they basically always foreshadow what's going to come in the on-year election. So in 2017, as an example, Virginia had the biggest pickup in 100 years. Um, and then you saw that was followed by a huge pickup in 2018 congressionally. So what happens in Virginia will affect um, and be a bellwether for really the nation. Um, and uh, we hope that you can help us um, bring victory there, which we think will foreshadow victory for 2020. So this is a big push for us and um, how the work gets done. Alex and Greg are obviously here in the room, but um, you know we have a full-time team of 15 people um, and that's growing to double or more for 2020. Um, you know, Dana runs all of Virginia. We have engineering team, we have a product team. So all of that goes to help Virginia and build things out. And it's, it's just a super important part of, um, you know, what we do as an organization and powering it. So um, that's an important way to be a part of it. So um, without further ado, I wanna turn it over to Q&A. Um, do we have any initial questions? Okay, we're looking, hold on. We always go, wait a second. Um, okay. Paul, a question about error ranges. We'll answer that offline. <laughs> <laughs> um, not because we don't wanna tell you, just because uh, we can't look it up in the detailed results at the moment. <laughs> so we'll follow up with you on Slack. Anybody else? I said, I hear um, this is really great work. Did the team have control groups for the texting research project? Yeah, so I can talk a little more about this. Um, basically, campaigns don't want to run randomized control trials because it means that they're leaving votes on the table. They're leaving voters on the table, which of course, you know, if you are um, used to running randomized control trials, which I mentioned is sort of the gold standard for analysis can be difficult. Um, so we did not have randomized control trials, but we controlled for all possible variables. So we controlled for support score, which is basically a model of how likely someone is to support the Democrat, um, past vote, voting behavior, age, other demographics, basically controlled for everything we possibly could 
uh, to try and make it as, as accurate and meaningful as possible. That was really a really important part of the analysis. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, Preston is asking, what kind of infrastructure and tools are you building to work across campaigns? Can I take that? Sure. Um, so in terms of infrastructure, I think of it first as sort of non-technical infrastructure. Uh, we have lots of internal playbooks and as a couple of folks have mentioned, benchmarks, um, detailed guides on how to run effective digital advertising projects, email marketing projects, build websites quickly. Um, also related to that, we have website templates that we've built out so teams can deploy customized websites super quickly. Um, and then we also have some additional products that we have been working on uh, to help larger organizations like caucuses manage their uh, teams better. So basically give them a lot of visibility into what's going on in the field as well as visibility into the spending on digital ads that both their candidates are doing and their opponents are doing, um, as well as outside groups. So, hey Pete, it's Greg. Um, so about releasing the information the, on the texting, the document that is on our website as the verdicts on the, verdict on the texting project, I think is a, a product of a lot of careful uh, analysis and judging on what we could you know, or what we think should be publicly available um, in terms of a reliable result over time. And so we've really tried to distill all the benefits of that project into the document that is currently posted on techforcampaigns.org. Um, there's a question about how to find the Slack for TFC. So we're um, quite, quite mindful of security. And so we actually keep Slack uh, lockdown unless you are actively or have been staffed on a project in the past. So um, you're actually not able to to get access to the Slack until you are staffed on a, a project. And someone is asking if there are opportunities for um, UX designers and strategists. Yes, so most of the projects that we do that benefit from UX and UI design skills are websites. And so we've actually completed all of our websites for the season. We will have a ton of websites to build in 2020. Um, so definitely pay attention to our newsletter uh, starting in January to look for, for opportunities. Um, and then if you also look in the Q&A, one of the answered questions has a link to the second phase of one of those tools that I mentioned um, that also has an opportunity for a UX UI designer. Cool. Uh, Paul, um, about post-election downtime, there won't be much. So the question will be um, beyond reaching out to the relevant state parties and caucuses, what plans do we have for post-VA election downtime? What downtime? Yeah, what downtime? <laughs> um, uh, no, I don't think there probably will be much. Uh, people will be starting to work on really early things like websites and email, uh, for, especially for incumbents. Uh, email fundraising and marketing projects will probably begin right at the beginning of the year. Um, and the planning for sort of the work that, that we do to work with the campaigns about planning out their communication strategy uh, definitely starts pretty early. So every campaign needs a website. A lot of them don't have very good ones and or, or cost a lot of money. And TFC provides um, excellent websites for an excellent price of zero. So um, it's, it's a really sort of universally useful thing and something that really takes up uh, quite a bit of the beginning quarters of, of the year. I, I would just add, actually, so um, I can just add a little color. Um, most of Greg's job right now is actually, he's most, he's, you know, done with Virginia. He's already talking to the 2020 campaign. So there is actually very little downtime. We're already talking with all of the 2020 states um, and trying to, solidify those and what the relationships will be before the end of the year. So um, the only other thing I would say is that we'll, we're hoping, although things have to, um, we'll do as we you know have done and some of it has been released publicly, um, postmortems on Virginia and adding those to the work that, that we've already done. So there'll be um, work there to do as well. Um, I think Kara asked, any advice for someone who wants to quit their job and work full time for a Democrat running for a state Senate in 2020? Um, first of all, yay for 
run it, working on um, state legislative races, the highest impact kind of race that you could work on. Um, I, uh, we can talk about it offline. I think there's two ways to do it. It really sort of depends on your skill set. There's usually only, honestly, two or three full time people on a state campaign. Um, so it, it sort of depends what you want to do uh, and where, where you want to be. Um, the other option is that as we solidify states and in Q1, we'll be hiring state directors. So um, those are both different options that um, people can think about. We're happy to talk through, um, and I, I would reach out to Greg specifically, um, um, specific states or campaigns where, um, you know, they might make sense. What else? Will you continue to research texting in the next elections? And so what new things will you be looking for? So the quick answer, Joe, is yes. We're constantly going to be updating um, research. Um, as far as what new questions we'll be looking for, um, Alex can talk more about what we didn't get to this time. Of course, we'll always be looking at what we think has already been answered. We'll want to confirm that that's still the truth because um, things change cycle over cycle as, as mediums change. Um, but I think other things that um, we either couldn't find a definitive correlation or felt like we didn't have enough data, um, Alex can answer. Yeah, I think uh, the most interesting question and probably the most important question that we weren't able to answer is, does the number of texts that you get change voting behavior? Um, you know, especially as lots of different campaigns in similar regions are doing things in an uncoordinated fashion, you really do start to worry about fatigue. Um, and so part of the way that we are approaching it is just to work directly with um, organizing bodies in the future so that we can coordinate sort of all of the texts that someone might get. And so we don't inundate them um, to the extent that that's possible. But we would also like to know sort of like, what is the optimal number of texts? You know, if you text someone three times, is that enough? And you can, you can leave it there. Or do you really need to keep following up until someone confirms that they vote? So I think that's probably the most um, high priority and interesting unanswered research question for texting. Okay, it looks like there's one more question about voter suppression and registering people to vote. Is that right? From Brian. Um, so basically the question is, are we doing anything about potential voter interference? Um, I think you mean uh, no, we're not doing anything about that, but about voter suppression slash getting people registered to vote. Um, last year, we developed something and, and beta tested it in Texas, um, where we focused on um, getting people who are unregistered registered, uh, using better data and basically reverse engineering a list of people who are uh, registered or unregistered to vote. There's lists out there of people who are registered, but there's actually no unregistered lists. And um, in 11 states, you cannot register online. So sort of the best alternative option is standing outside of a grocery store and hoping you find people who are not registered. So um, last year in Texas, um, we tested something where we can find the addresses of people who are unregistered and um, we built a initial app around uh, targeting them and having, allowing campaigns to send volunteers to those houses. Um, so that's something that we, we are working on. Um, it's actually a much bigger deal to do stuff like that in the states where um, there's no online voter registration. If, if there is online voter registration, it's honestly better to do it online. Um, so we'll, we would work with them on that, but um, it, that's just an easier way to scale and target than, than offline. Um, and it's in terms of fair fight, um, we helped Stacey Abrams last year, so we're in contact with them. They're really just getting up and running. So um, it's TBD as whether or not we'll do anything with them. I think that is it. We'll give 30 more seconds if anyone has a, a final question, but um, I just wanna thank everyone who joined tonight, um, Jennifer and Ron specifically. Thank you guys so much for joining and the work that you did. and. Larry, who has already left and probably went to make more phone calls um, and send more texts, um, and obviously also just the internal team at Tech for Campaigns, who um, you guys don't always see or hear from, but um, which really makes things run, um, you know, all day, every day. Uh, it's 
you hear from Alex and Greg sometimes and they're amazing. There's probably 10 to 12 more people right now that are, are making things happen. So um, just know that um, there, it's, this is not a volunteer only um, type thing. The volunteers are super, super integral and thank you guys, but make sure that when you get a second, you um, thank the full-time team as well. So thank you guys. I hope that you can join us in either um, volunteering and giving to the Virginia Fund. Um, this, is a, this is a really pivotal election that I think will be tone setting for what will happen in 2020. So thank you guys so much. Um, we'll see you online um, and uh, hopefully at the next All Hands as well. Have a great night. Thank you, everybody.